All right, hey guys, it's Jason with Kentucky Sustainable Living. I've got Corey here with me. He's one of the members of our group. Uh, he's got his extra class ham license. I've got my general ham license. Uh, we're gonna do a quick intro, uh, pretty much basic emergency radio comms uh, is what we're gonna do. We're not gonna get too deep in the weeds with it and try not to do that, but just a basic overview of radio comms for emergencies and preparedness. So we'll kind of start out with our frequencies, uh, start out and go into ham licensing levels, and then come over with your different types of radios and stuff like that. We'll touch on a few antenna things and stuff like that, but we're gonna kind of keep it real simple, dumbed down, and later on in the future, we'll probably dive a little bit deeper in some stuff like that. So I'll start off <coughs> your frequencies, your basic frequencies that you can use for everything. You've got your FRS, your family radio service, is essentially your little bubble pack radios you're gonna buy from Walmart, Sam's, Cabela's. Uh, they, they don't have removable antennas, very limited range and very limited power. Most of those, were they, a half watt is what yep. they're running on? Yeah, not much. Yeah, like a half watt is what they're gonna run on. You can step up to your GMRS GMRS, uh, you have to have a license. The license does essentially go on the FCC website, fill out the paperwork, give them your debit or your credit card. They accept it, no test, no anything. And then in about a week or so, they'll send you your license and you're ready to go with a call sign. Uh, so you'll need a license for it. Like I said, it's easy to get. Uh, it ups your power. You can run more power on your mm -hmm. GMRS. You can run bigger antennas. Uh, there's really not any limit on the height of an antenna. No, the higher that. the better. Yeah, the higher the better. Elevation is everything. <coughs> Your MERS uh, is, you've only got five, I think it's five channels with MERS. Uh, you've got it. It's still a low power frequency. There's no license need, needed for it. A lot of the guys will use MERS when you see them in a Sam's Club and stuff like that. Their little bubble radios they're using are usually on a MERS frequency. Uh, you can use those, no license needed, like I said. Uh, your marine, uh, marine radios, there's no license for that that I know of, but you're essentially only supposed to use marine bands when you're on the water or close to the water like if you're going to if you're on the on the land and you're going to call to a boat is technically mm -hmm. the only time you're supposed to use those uh i don't know about the power ratings on it most of the time your marine stuff is like 50 watts somewhere around in there uh, all four of these frequencies are line of sight so essentially if i can see you i can talk to you and with your line of sight, the higher you get with your antenna, the more uh, distance you're going to be able to cover. But essentially, a, a way to see it is if I can see you, I can talk to you kind of thing. Uh, then after the marine, you get into your ham frequencies. With uh, the ham frequencies, you've got your UHF and VHF. Those are like your two meter, your uh, 70 centimeter and one point one and a quarter meter band, I think mm -hmm. is what it is. Those are also line of sight. So it's still height of your antenna is king on that. Uh, then you go in to your HF bands, your high frequency bands. That is regional, national, and worldwide comms. You, you've heard people, oh, I talked to a guy in Europe the other day on a ham radio. That, he's using the mm -hmm. HF frequencies. Uh, it gets real deep in the weeds, but essentially, you're shooting your radio signal into the atmosphere and it's bouncing back down. It'll hit the atmosphere and bounce back down. Uh, like that old game, uh, the battle, the tank game that you used to play where you'd shoot, where you'd shoot your... Uh, Had to get all your angles get, right. Yeah, and get all the that. angles yeah. right yeah. and bounce it back down. Uh, some of the stuff, real quick, let me find this. Uh, one of the things uh, that you might want to look at, the difference between the UHF and the VHF, is uh, your uh, UHF usually is in is better for indoors. So it's better for indoors. It'll penetrate structures better, and it's better for urban areas. Uh, your VHF is better for outdoor use. Uh, it doesn't do. We'll put, uh, 
uh, your uh, your VHF really does not uh, go through structures all that well, and it's all to do with the wavelength, and we won't get into that kind of stuff right now. But uh, Corey's going to talk a little bit, or we will. Uh, all right, and well, one other thing. UHF and VHF are pretty simple as far as making contacts with it. You've just got certain frequencies you can make mm -hmm. contacts on. It's fairly easy to make contacts on your UHF and VHF. Once you step into HF, there's just a huge spectrum of frequencies and it's, it's a pretty big learning curve also on that. Uh, it, it took me a long time to finally make some HF contacts once I got into HF frequencies and playing around with it. But once you get the hang of it, it's fun. It's kind of a challenge to make some of these contacts. Also, another thing, once you get into your HF frequencies, the price to play, to play the game gets, you know, a lot steeper. With the UHF and VHF, you can get, what are the bow fangs now, 40 bucks? Yeah, they've gone up a little bit, but not much. You can yeah. get a bow fang, uh, get your tech license, get a bow fang for 30 or 40 bucks, and you can be making contacts today, talking to people local, hitting repeaters. HF stuff, uh, to really get set up nice, a minimum setup would probably be at least 800 bucks. Yeah, that's a cheap one. Well, you can go five and six, but it's... it's Used equipment. Well, not necessarily. You can With buy the new G, stuff. The but it has, it has no filters. Yeah. You're hearing everything, all the noise there is to hear. You know, yeah. So if you want a, a better one that's got all the filters where you can hear better, it's definitely going to cost you some money. Yeah. yeah. So pro probably a good thing, you're probably looking at HF setup, get in there a thousand bucks is probably what you yep. can figure uh but now you can buy used hf equipment uh all my hf equipment except for one radio has been used and i've not had any problems whatsoever with the used equipment uh most of the time the guy if you buy it from an older guy he's taking good taking care, care of it, it. Mm -hmm. uh i'll tell you i bought a uh, 20 something year old kenwood hf rig it had the original box had the original owner's manual and it had note after note that the guy had written in there mm -hmm. for me and the thing looked pristine good as new except for a few of the knobs right. that had a little bit of the stuff worn off on it yeah but uh Corey, i'll turn it over to you and you can talk about yeah. some of the license levels mm -hmm. and stuff so the license level technician that would be what you'd want to get if you wanted to operate one of these he was talking about a bow fang this is basically what a bow fang is All right, so if you have your tech license, or if you get your tech license, you can operate what he was talking about a while ago, a bow fang. This is an 8-watt bow fang. Usually you can buy the 5 watts a lot cheaper than you can buy the 8 watts for. Uh, and, of course, this is an aftermarket um, antenna. The, the rubber duckies they come with aren't very good. But this is what you can operate with your tech license. And, uh, you know, it's, it's all line of sight. And, quite frankly, with this bow fang or with any HT, well, the, the bow fangs especially, the... You know, you just don't have the range as you would because it only pushes so much power. The power is also kind of king in line of sight. Uh, uh, so the next, uh, the next one to go to is general. So with general, you can operate the HF. And when you're talking about regional, nationwide, and worldwide, if we're in a comms down or a grid down situation, it, I feel like personally it's very important to know not only what's going on in the community, community wide locally, but it's also very important to know statewide maybe even nationwide or internationally because people are there's chatter people are talking and now the chatter goes way down because you're the grid down situation no power but you still have those people that are going to be uh chattering and talking about different things statewide and statewide net nets go on all the time when there's an emergency whether it's earthquake ice storm what do you name it whatever kind of emergency you can get there's all all kinds of nets it's always going on to let you know what's going on around and then, um the, the nice thing about the regional stuff is you can you can get pretty easy three to four hundred miles out. Oh, yes. So, I mean, you're talking to somebody three or four hundred miles out, and he tells yeah. you, you know, the zombie horde is coming to <laughs> coming to eat your dogs and your kids. You've got time to prepare because the zombies are slow. So you've got plenty of time, you know, in that three to four hundred mile buffer. Right. Uh, know what's going on. Yeah, and, uh, you know, as, as far as... Uh, um, what you're talking about, the regional, um, you know, it depends on what band you have. So I know that's kind of going a little more into HF, but if you're doing, you know, 80 meter has a certain, you know, length of propagation that it kind of uh, localizes, specializes in. Then you got 40 meter and 20 meter and 17, and all of them have a different 
propagation. So 20 meters where you would go internationally. If you wanted to talk to, um, you know, Slovenia or somewhere like that's actually where I made a contact one time with a guy in Slovenia. He was on, I was on 20 meters. 40 meters, more of the statewide, you know, that's where the, those local nets are going on at. And 80 meters kind of, you know, is right there with it. It works good at night. It works good at night. And that's another thing, sun propagation. Yes. It not only affects HF bands, but it also affects VHF, the sun. When you become a ham radio operator, you really start paying attention to more about what that sun's doing because it can really affect radio communications. Uh, that's a big thing. But, uh, that, you know, if anybody was to ask me, Corey, what, what should I get as far as a, a license go? I would say general at the least because you really need this regional and nationwide, especially for emergency comms. It's very important, and it is, you know, as far as you get to talking about, like, radio-to-radio -radio communication or what we call simplex, um, you can do a lot of that, you know, with your tech license locally, but when you get on HF, that's mainly what it is. You're not talking into what we call a repeater, like on two meter where you're hitting the tower and then it's spreading out your signal to other people. So we're doing more of a simplex thing because when you're grid down situation, simplex radio to radio communication is kind of where it's at. Yeah, and you're going with the simplex. We'll explain. If you've got Corey over here with his little radio and you've got me with my little radio, Simplex is going straight radio to radio communications. But the thing is, if we've got a hill in between us, we can't talk. Right. If, you, if you want to do with a repeater, most of the, the two meter and 70 centimeter stuff, uh, the UHF and VHF, a lot of guys are running with the repeaters, which the big thing, the repeaters, how long is a repeater going to last when the grid's down? Depends on how long that generator runs. Yeah. You know. So, I mean, they might be up for a few days. Yeah. Some of them might be just up for a few hours. Some of them just yeah. run straight battery some, power. Yes, well, some of them don't even have that. They're just yeah. straight power. So when the electricity goes out, it's down. Yeah, so and if you're doing with a repeater, you've got a repeater up here. And essentially what the repeater's going to do, I can see that repeater, and that repeater can see me. So I come in and call. I'm like, hey, Corey. The repeater comes in, takes my signal, and shoots it back down to Corey. Kind of like... Uh, this is kind of where cell phones originated from, if we're just being honest. This yeah. is old cell phone technology. Yeah. We've just, they've just expanded it and made it more and stuff like that. And then, now, talking about antenna and height is king. If I'm sitting in my house right here, and I've got an antenna that comes all the way up to here, and uh, Corey's sitting in his house over here, and he's got an antenna that comes up to here, and we're above that hill, then we can do simplex communications because we've got our, both our antennas can see each other. That or talking about the community that we're trying to form, at the end of the day, not only do you got me and you, but you got a guy over here and a guy over there. If two or three of those guys can't hit each other, surely one can relay the information we're trying to get out. Yeah, because Jim Bob could be over here and there's a, there's a deep ditch in between uh, and there's a big hill here. He can't get to Corey, but he can get to me. Right. And then, We've shrunk, the, or we've still got the hill, but we've got tall antennas. Jim Bob can tell me what he needs to tell Corey, and then I can get the message to Corey, almost like the old game telephone mm -hmm. that we played in school. Yep, basically. And, you know, there's a lot of guys out here, I'm going to go ahead and say this, that think that if you have one of these and that um, you don't really need your license because when, during an emergency you can communicate if we're under some kind of national emergency or something along those lines. Eh, I like the saying that you had the other day. You wouldn't buy a gun if you didn't train with it, you didn't use it. Same way with a radio. If you're not training with your radio or have something even greater than just a bow fang, you could be in trouble because this is not very much elevation right here. It doesn't go up very high. Um, and there's not enough power to push that signal through trees and one thing or another. And trees, trees is a big thing that can stop a ham radio signal. Um, the kind of tree it is and one thing or another or kind of obstacle but if you got a little more power to shoot that signal through it can get through push and these right just through. doesn't they don't have quite the push to do it yeah and then we're talking about your ham license levels one thing you can look at it is your tech license when you get your tech license you've got that single shot 22 rifle that's, that's right. what you've got yeah. yes you've got the ability to shoot something and bring it home or protect yourself when you step up to your general license Essentially, you've stepped up and you've got an AR-15 yep. with a 30-round mag. You're, you're Billy Badass. You can do all kinds of stuff. <laughs> Stepping up to your general, 
that's when you get, you've got a freaking bazooka. I mean, you can take out and do whatever mm -hmm. you want to. You can shoot your bazookas with, at the freaking deer and just annihilate a whole herd and bring yep. them home to eat. Now, as far as extra class goes, uh, you know, again, I would say to get general, but for me, there, I'm an extra. The reason why I got extra, yes, it gives you more frequencies in, in HF. Uh, <laughs> I guess you could say that. Uh, you know, but at the end of the day, for me, you know, yeah, you you got a little bit more uh, room to, and like 80 meter, for instance, that's kind of where you gain your most traction there, most uh, transmit capabilities. At the end of the day, uh, yes, it definitely does extend. There's a, there's a section there that usually 80 meters is pretty crowded. Yeah. Well, if you go down there in that section, it gets a lot less crowded. Yeah. It's a lot nicer to talk on. But at the end of the day, that's not the reason why I got my extra. I got my extra because... In order to test other people in my community, you got to be a VE, a volunteer examiner is what it's called. You can be a VE if you're a general, but you can only test for the tech license. So there's a lot of people usually at these test stations that want to go general or even extra. The only way that you can test all three is to have that extra class. That's very important if you're going to be a VE. And that's why I got my extra is because of that. And I've thought about getting my extra, but I've... I've got uh -oh, other, we got to I've talk got into other, it now. Other irons in the fire. <laughs> so, but yeah, yeah, essentially, the the farther you go with the ham levels, the more privileges you've got, and the better ability to communicate. Yeah, and the only way to really uh, understand how ham radio works is if you are a ham radio operator and you are, you know, like right now, if we're on the radio, mainly it's a fun thing. It's yeah. a it's a hobby thing. Well, that can soon very quickly turn into not a hobby but a necessity. It's very important. What's the first thing a military does when they go and set up and if they're invading or, or one thing or another? Communication. They yeah. got to know what they're what, what what's going on around them or what you know the front line is doing or not doing. They got to know this stuff you know in order to to set up. If you don't have communication, you don't really have anything. Yeah, and really just think about it. Leave your leave your cell phone at the house. Turn your radio off while you're driving in the car. And well, essentially, turn the radio off, turn your TV off the house, turn your cell phone off the house, and stay on your property. That's what you're. That's the yep. only. That, that's that's what it's going to be when a grid down yep. is. That's right. No cell phones, no TV going. There might be the emergency broadcast system, but they're going to sell you propaganda. Is all they're going to do with that's that. Right. But if you if you have no way to get inside outside information, you're going to be sitting there in the dark, yep. not knowing what's going on whatsoever. And the cool part between say uh, your, what you can get with your tech license and what you can get with your general license is let's go with antennas. Yeah. Perfect example. With an HF antenna, there are antennas out there that I'll just about guarantee you, if you're not a ham radio operator, you will never spot my HF antenna. It is virtually invisible yeah. because it's one single little bitty line hanging up in a tree. You just, it's very hard to see with all the other stuff going on. However, with VHF, with your tech license or UHF, you can see those. They're, they're, they're you know, if, if anybody can spot a CB antenna or something along those lines, they can spot a VHF antenna. Or, but or with old, HF. Or the old school TV antennas. That's I right. Mean, that, that's all you've got to look at. We, yeah. You looked at my HF antenna, but you knew what you were looking for right. and you saw it. But <laughs> it, essentially, you've got a ballum that's the size of an inch and a half PVC and about six to eight inches long. And you can make it black, you can make yeah. it green. I mean, you can- Mine's a coyote you know. tan kind of color. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. But it is, it's just a stinking mm -hmm. wire about 12 feet off the ground. It's hard to see. 100 watts in a wire. So, yeah, so I mean, as far as, uh, I guess yours is called chameleon. That's yeah, a perfect a word brand. for it because at the end of the day, you can't see the darn thing, you know. And the but, HF yeah. stuff, you can throw, I mean, you can take wire and just a few miscellaneous things if yes. you know what you're doing and string, you can go out in the middle of the field, string something up five to six foot off the ground and have regional comms with HF. You can you can run portable and you can usually have, I think the portable guys can have them up within just minutes. Yeah. Just, it doesn't take no time. Uh, just power source, which, you know, if you can go solar, that's the best way yep. to go. Um, you know, or battery in this case, you can do that too. Or, you know, as far as the, yeah, just throw, throw a line over a tree and you know pick up them lines make you know make sure your lines are the right the right length and that's really all that matters yeah you know it's not hard to figure all that out and we'll go in uh we're going to keep it kind of short and not cover a whole lot we'll go in and try to do some more series too we're just kind of hitting the high points sure. to get people thinking about to where you can do some of the edge do some of the looking yourself you know this is just to get your feet wet and be like hey this is something i need to look at we're by no means the be-all, end-all in communications whatsoever. But 
you've got different types of radios, like what Corey's got, your Baofeng, your HTs, your handhelds. Uh, with those, you've got limited antennas, you've got limited power on that. What's the, what's the highest, like a 10 watts the highest I've seen? I'm not real sure. I know this is an 8 watt. I know as they make as... five eights, and I think somebody makes a 10, ten watt. Yeah. So you're lim Possibly. really limited on that. Yes, you can put a bigger antenna. You could put a J-pole on it mm -hmm. if you wanted to. Yeah, but again, you run into the power to push. If there's just not yeah. enough power to push it, you're just only you're just limited in your in, in what you have. But like my base station, I can push 50 watts, yeah. and I've got it 53, 52 foot up above is where is where it is. I mean, you know, and it's a quad, so I can push some power out there and push push a distance. And you um, can, w once you step up from your HTs, you've got your mobile and your base stations. The, the mobiles and the base stations, essentially most of them are running 12 volts, mm -hmm. 12 or 13.8 if we're real correct, or 12 volts is what we'll call it. Uh, those are some that you can put in your vehicle. You can bring them inside if you want to. Uh, those you're pushing, uh, a lot of them will run 25 watts. Most of them max out at 50 watts. 50, yep. I know Yezu makes a There's 65. There's a few 75 waters and yeah. things like that. I know Yezu makes a 65 yeah. watt, and I think it's just a two meter only rig. Uh, I'm not sure. I was looking the other day. I think that's what it is. But yeah. your mobiles, you've got a lot more power on it. And really, you can run an amplifier if you want to. What's the max, oh, yeah. what's the max you can run on two meter? Was it, if it well? It depends if you're tech or general. It goes up. Um, to be honest with you, I can't remember because I, well, I know the, the reason why I didn't really pay attention to that is because because of what I do with ham radio, I'm never going to get to that yeah. peak. It's like it's like 1500 uh, peak envelope power is what it is. Yeah. But I, I'm only ever going to run 100 watts. Is that, well on VHF it'll just be 50. Is all I'll probably ever run. Yeah. But with general, 100 watts, and the reason why I do that is because. Well, I mean, you know, I could go out here and buy that Mercedes or the Cadillac yeah. or whatever, but what's the point when at the end of the day that doesn't fit my lifestyle, that doesn't yeah. fit what I'm trying to do? Exactly. So if anything, to be honest with you, I try to run five watts yeah. if I can. If I, The lowest power you can run, the better, because that way if you are, for instance, in a grid down if a grid down situation, what am I going to do? I'm going to go outside and get a car battery out of my car, hook that booger up to my radio. If, you're, if I'm using all 50 watts, that battery is going to run yeah. less time. Therefore, I've got to, you know, make preparations to run less time. But uh, but in the situation I'm running five watts, that battery's gonna last a lot longer. Yeah. And so, well, the you know. Yezus, the Yezus on a 100 watt HF Yezu yeah. is running about, tw is pulling about 23 amps is what it's pulling out of a battery. You're gonna drain a freaking 100 amp hour battery pretty stinking quick yes. if you don't have a yes. way to recharge it. That's right. So. Yeah. But yeah, your mobiles, I mean, most of the time you're at about 50 watts uh, for your mobiles. The HF uh, base stations are usually 100 watts is what they're going to do. But all of these, once you get to the base stations and your HF stations, you've got uh, programs in there where you can adjust and do what kind of wattage you want to put on there. Most of them will step at like 5, right. 10, 15, 25, 30, 50, and up to 100. Or if you have a really cool radio, you can just turn the knob and yeah. <laughs> put whatever power out you want. Yeah, And then yeah. once you get into your base stations and your HF, mm -hmm. Uh, and your HF stations, then that's when you get into your bigger antennas and stuff like that to where you can really get out and go. And like Corey said, mm -hmm. uh, the big thing I hate about it too is everybody in the prepping community is like, get your tech license, get a Baofeng, and it's like the silver bullet. That thing is not the silver bullet. Mm -hmm. uh, you really need to have good regional comms you really need to get up to your general license and play in the hf game is yeah. honestly what you need to be yeah and there's a lot of things you know uh, uh, for instance we had uh, i think two years ago we had a it wasn't really considered an ice storm but it did put about a quarter inch of ice on my antennas and i did not have an, a tuner which basically what a tuner does is if you don't have your antenna on hf if you don't have your t uh, your antenna exactly the right si uh, length on both sides well, you're going to have an issue. Yep. And so what that tuner does is a cheat code, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, you can you can uh, get that SWR right to where your radio doesn't... Uh, you can actually blow up a radio if you ain't got your SWR right. So it's pretty important to have that right. But I didn't have a tuner at the time, and I knew I was talking on HF, and the guys were like, hey, uh, you don't sound the same. What's going on? Well, my radio was bending back. It's, a, it's basically an automatic way to not blow up your radio. Most modern radios now have a way to where, you know, it'll it'll turn its own power back manually or I guess you know by itself automatically in order to uh, not blow itself up 
So I'm transmitting, and they're telling me that, uh, well, your power, something, something's wrong. Well, what I realized was is because the ice that was on my antennas was just enough ice to mess up my SWR <laughs> to where I couldn't transmit without my, my power. Being, they couldn't hear me because at that point in time, I couldn't put out the power. Yeah. Couldn't put it out. So they couldn't hear me. But I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't have that to where I could transmit. Because, like, I know a couple guys are like, well, you know, I don't really want to get my license yet. Well, that's cool, whatever. But you're not going to know the things that you can do unless you can actually experiment with the radio itself. You're going to be out there, grid down situation, something's bad happening, and all of a sudden your radio ain't working. Like, what's going on? What am I doing wrong? Well, you may know that if you actually had practice in doing it. Exactly. And, uh... Corey, what do you want to talk about? I know there's some stuff you wanted to talk about as far as like reasons, yes. uh, uh, situations where you could have, you know, emergency comms and not just a grid down or an SHFT oh. situation, you know. Yep. Even when the zombies aren't coming and coming for everybody, still there's still times that ham radio is useful. Well, um, good example, weather nets. You know, we have severe weather every now and then. We had a slightly severe weather the other night. Yeah. And weather nets where you can get on the radio and, and you can listen to real-time people. Hey, I've got hail over here, or I've got this kind of wind. I've just had a tornado come through. They're, they're putting out all information real time. So if you can be on the radio and hear that, that's helpful. And I did that in January. I was downstairs mm -hmm. in the basement with the family, and I was listening on the radio for everybody that was calling through what was yep. coming and everything like that. Well, and, you know, last de December during the December tornadoes here in Kentucky, uh, the one I had my HT because when you're going down the basement, that's not where my base station is. Oh, yeah. But this is my last line of defense. So I'm down there. Of course, it diminishes everything when you've got one of these in the basement. It don't work real well. Yeah. You've got no elevation. It's just not good. But, you know, I had it there. I could always get out real close if I had to. But the, the one cool thing that I guess my first emergency comm situation that I had was in the Nashville bombings. So... There wasn't a serious, it wasn't a grid down situation by any means, but I had friends that had the, the, the certain brands of cell phones that they couldn't, they, they had no cell phone. They had no service whatsoever. And so the only way I could talk to them was on the radio. Not to mention, I could actually listen to what was going on down there in the buildings basically firsthand 30 minutes to an hour before it ever come across the news agencies because they had, you know, basically emergency net set up yeah. to where they were telling us, hey, this is what's going on, this is what's happening. They're just trying to relay information and get it out. And uh, without the radio, I would have not known the stuff that I would have known because there's some of us they don't talk about on TV. Yeah. So, and and yeah. the thing is, you look at how fragile the infrastructure is. Yes. The Nashville bombing put out a major section of cell phone service, yes. and it was, what, two days or better? Two to three days. It may have been days. longer than that. It was quite a while. Yeah, I mean, we're yeah. looking, some of it I know didn't get fixed for about a week, I think. So yeah. that's how fragile just one incident puts out a whole big place Yes. with the ham radio and, and even with all the other different frequencies here, if we've got, again, back to the example, two guys with their bow fangs, the only infrastructure we, we've got is that radio and that radio and a way to charge the batteries. Yes. That's the only infrastructure. I mean, they can set off a, a big bomb in Nashville right. again. But these two guys, as long as they can see each other and they've got a way to charge their batteries, they can talk. Same thing with HF. You know, it, you know this, might, this is just line of sight, but if we want to do regional or national comms, the only infrastructure you have with the HF is your radio, your antenna, and a way to keep power to that. That's it. That's yeah. the only infrastructure. Everything else... EMP happens as long as your equipment's not messed up. You've got it in a Faraday cage. Yep. If your equipment is still good, the whole national grid is down. The only thing you have to worry about is your radio, your antenna, that's and it. a way to get power to it, and you're set and ready to go. And that's, that's, that's the great thing about it. And I know somebody will put in the comments, well, they can jam your frequencies. Yeah, they can jam yeah, they the can, frequencies, yeah. but there's so many damn frequencies. If you know what you're doing, you yeah. can hop around and find frequencies well, that aren't jammed. Just a year or two ago, Cuba was jamming frequencies yeah. down there. Um, uh, I'm not really sure what was going on exactly when they were jamming frequencies, but they, they actually, actually, as the ham radio community in different parts of the international community, we actually triangulated you know, generally where, where it was coming from on the map. And... Uh, you know, still not sure why they're, I guess they were, there were some Cubans trying to get some information out that they didn't want to get out. So well, that, yeah, I mean, 
but yeah. still they, they can only jam so many frequencies they, yeah. and you can yeah. if you know what you're doing and experienced enough you can hop yeah. around and find something some way to get out sure yeah i mean there's you know we have what we call elmers in the helm radio community ham radio community that that are you know our people that show us what we're doing wrong they're, they're the people that know everything but even them guys don't really know everything because it just it's a rabbit hole that you it just keeps on going it's a never-ending rabbit yeah. hole and a never-ending expense too if, you, yes. if you're doing it <laughs> yeah i don't want to talk so, to my wife about that <laughs> oh i know it, well it's like the saying is if i die and uh, my wife sells my guns for what I told her I paid yeah. for them. If, if, yeah. if you die and it's like, oh, yeah, honey, I only spent $100 on this. You're yeah. going to roll over in your grave. <laughs> so yeah. it, if you've got to do that, tell somebody that you trust what those radios are worth. Yes. So. Yeah. Usually the ham radio community is pretty good about that. They'll, for the most part, they'll tell you, hey, this is worth this. Well, you know, the guys are pretty good. But yeah. anyway. And you can find some good equipment and some good used equipment from Silent Keys uh, at yes. the Ham Fest. I bought some stuff from Silent Keys. So, yes. yeah, that's, well, the Ham Fest is a good place to to go anyway. To, I mean, actually, that's where I bought the radio that I'm using now. Yeah. Is at the Ham Fest. That was a, a local Ham Fest here, and uh, it's a good radio, very good radio. I have no problem with it at all. Is there anything else that you think we need to cover? Yes, CW mode. Yes. So just saying the, the letter CW, the, the typical person out there, the average person, wouldn't really understand what that means. It just It's Morse code, okay? And when it comes to grid down situations and, you know, getting a little deeper in the fact that, hey, I need, you know, um, Jim Bob over there to not really understand what I'm trying to say to everybody else, so you have code. And yeah. a lot of people don't know code. There's a yes. lot of people that don't. But there's a lot, of, a lot of code going on even today on the frequencies. You can get on there and hear it going through there all the time. So there's quite a few people that know it, but at the same time, it's a way to get out there without, you know, not everybody knowing what you're saying. And it's a, it, you've got to take the time to learn it. I do yeah, not know a, CW, do not do it, and I will not admit that I know code. I do not know code either, but I am in the process of learning. If, knowing code is like knowing another language. Yeah. It's literally like speaking another language. I've heard stories of where guys can be driving down the road, making contacts, and they got the, 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 the key on their leg, just going down the road, you know, watching the road, but, you know, making yeah. contacts while they're doing their thing. So it's pretty cool what, what they're capable of. And with code, it requires a lot less power. Yes. So sometimes I need 100 watts to get into Slovenia to get that guy, that contact, make that contact. With CW, you could do it on 5 watts. Yeah. It just doesn't need, you know... And the only other thing I would say about it is, as far as ham radio in general and communications, you know, this, you know, we have natural disasters that we don't really talk about a lot, the sun, things yeah. like that. And with ham radio, it kind of is a, a giveaway of what the sun's doing because yeah. depending on what's going on in the bands overall, if you, if you are at least a general, you can kind of uh, monitor what's going on across all the bands with different radios. And you can hear, well, that's acting different. That's usually a nighttime band, yeah. and it's now it's good in the day. What's going on? And it'll tip you off a little bit on some things that's going around. Exactly. Well, I think we've kind of covered yeah. the the basics of it, and I hope y'all, I hope this has helped y'all and got kind of got your appetite up on, hey, I might want to get into some of this. Uh, in the comments, drop a comment if there's something that you want us to cover more in depth on another video. Put a comment in there and say, hey, I, I would like to see y'all cover some stuff like this. We'll be more than happy to do this. We're going to go, hopefully we, we'll get time to do some other videos, some more in-depth stuff and do that. But that's about all we've got for right now. Uh, I appreciate y'all watching. If you found it useful, like and subscribe. And Corey, I appreciate you coming out and helping me today. I appreciate you. Y'all right. have a good night.